We're here today to talk about internet addiction. You know, when I first started talking about this topic, it was the late 1990s. And we really called it internet addiction, but of course now it's expanded to other forms of digital media, digital media technology, which of course would include these devices. Speaking of these devices, if you have any of them on ring, if you could put them on vibrate, that would be great. We know that they're highly distractible, and by the way, extraordinarily addictive. <laughs> I, I will talk about smartphones later and multitasking and everything. I'll talk a little bit about what the agenda is for today. We're, first, we're going to talk about the sort of theoretical basis as to why this technology is addictive. What about it makes it addictive? Why is it that everybody in this room, virtually everybody in this room, and I'll ask you to do a, a count of hands, how many people, when you go on this technology, lose track of time? Doesn't, do you ever wonder why? Well, today you're going to learn why. We're going to talk about exactly why. And it's, it's going to be interesting and surprising because there are some things that make sense and some things that don't make sense about why it's so addictive. I've been looking at this, as I said, since the late, 19, late 1990s, and we do have some clear ideas now as to why it's so addictive. Now, of course, the word addictive is probably not the best word. You, as well as I, know that the word addiction doesn't really appear in the medical nomenclature. We use words like dependency and abuse, but for the purposes of this talk, we're going to use the word addiction. And I will talk a little bit about some of the um, efforts to formalize the diagnostic criteria, but for the purposes of this talk, we'll talk about addiction. So we're going to talk about the theory first as to why this technology is addictive, and then we're going to move into specifically some of the content areas that are most addictive. And the two largest content areas that we find problems with are gaming and sex. And sex, of course, encompasses a lot of areas which we'll talk about. We'll talk about gaming as well. I will talk a little bit about gambling. Then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, diagnosis and treatment, some treatment considerations. We're going to have some discussion around teens and children. I'm sure this is a topic that everybody struggles with either with, I have a 15 and 17 year old and I can tell you that if I didn't know how to text I would have no contact with my children at this point. And I'm not joking. This generation has created a new language. It has differentiated itself from all previous generations with a new language which is texting. It's fascinating. And it is their individuation point in uh, their development which we'll talk a little bit about. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, future trends and some of the upcoming issues that I see with this technology. And that should take us through the day. That's a lot of material to cover. Did you guys see the video uh, of the guy who shot the laptop? Did you hear about this video? It went viral. It's very funny. It's, uh, although it turned out to be less funny after the fact, after I found out the truth about it. It was a father who got tired of his daughter's use and abuse of, the, of Facebook, and she had he had asked her to do some chores, and she complained about it, and she wrote about it on Facebook, and then d sort of did it in a secret way. And then he was, a, of course, an IT professional. He hacked into her Facebook account, found out what she was saying about him, got enraged, took her laptop, put it on the ground in a field outside his house, set up a camera on a video tripod, and took out his 45 caliber gun, and put eight rounds through the laptop, <laughs> and put it on film, and then put it up on YouTube, or on Facebook, I don't know. But it went viral, the police investigated, DCF or the equivalent in that state investigated, and actually the police congratulated him, and he was completely exonerated for being a good parent, uh, because he put eight rounds into the laptop. But then I later found out, I thought this was kind of an interesting story, that he had actually taken the hard drive out of the laptop, so everything of hers was intact. So it was really more of a, a scare tactic for her. So this is what People Magazine th thinks uh, an internet addict looks like. Um, lovely photo, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it? Believe it or not, it took six hours to shoot that photo. It never looked so good. OK, so I'm going to talk for a second about my background, how I got interested in this, uh, because it, it's a little bit relevant to how uh, I came up with some of the ideas. I have a background in addictionology. My uh, 
doctorate is in uh, clinical and counseling psychology, but my, I did a lot of training and extra focus on the addictions area. And this is back when addictions was not a popular subject. In fact, the people didn't want to do rotations in the hospitals on the addictions floors because it was considered um, not pleasant. And I was fascinated by addictions from an early age and studied addictions. And this is way before the internet. This was back in the early to mid 1980s. And the internet was not even, it was on the horizon, but only in university settings and military settings. And I also had a background in technology. I was one of those people that worked his way through graduate school and college. And the way I did that was I was an electronics technician. So I fixed TVs and stereos. This is back when you used to call a TV repairman, and he'd come into your house with a box, and you know, you'd, he'd fix your TV, and then go home, and then you'd wonder why you paid him so much. Uh, I was that guy. So I, I had a background in electronics. So in the late uh, 1990s, I got a computer, like many of us, and that computer was hooked to the internet. And this is back when the internet was dial-up only. I don't know if those of you remember that, but this is back when you used to turn on the internet and it would move at about 14.4, which is very slow. It would take a long time for an image to come up. It's a lot easier to become sex addicted on the internet now than it was in those days. What I noticed was something that you all raised your hand about is I would go online and I wasn't really doing anything useful at that time. There really wasn't that much useful stuff to do. It was still very new, but I found myself losing track of time and space. I would stare at the screen and I'd be on for hours doing nothing, really. And I discovered very quickly that there was something psychoactive about the internet. Psychoactive means that there's something that changes your mood and consciousness. Something about the experience, the internet experience, that is mind and mood altering. And that's why all of you raised your hand a minute ago. That's why you said you lose track of time and space. Because what you're talking about, and we'll talk about a whole list of these criteria, what you're talking about is dissociation. You're talking about a artificially induced dissociation. Not unlike a dissociation that you'd experience when you go to a movie or reading a good book, like Fifty Shades of Grey. How many people are reading that book right now? <laughs> it's a lot better to write describing sex than write about sex in terms of book sales. Um, so what I discovered was that this psychoactive phenomena is something unique about the interface between the technology itself and the user. And that's what produces the uh, addicted experience. And I'll explain what some of those features are. It doesn't really matter what the, use, what the device is that you're using. You know, you gotta remember when I started talking about this, wireless internet didn't really exist. It was all wired. And laptops were just beginning to become popular at that point. There were no iPads, there were no iPhones, there were no smartphones, and we were completely tethered. But what we have found is as we've extended to wireless devices and portable devices like laptops and iPads, the same principles of addiction apply no matter what the device is. So when we talk about the internet, we're really talking about all these devices put together as a conglomerate. And it doesn't really matter how you get access to it. There's something about that interface that produces the dissociation. Okay, oh, this, this is a few little jokes. You refer going to the bathroom as downloading and eating as uploading. Your cat has its own homepage. You can't call your mother and she can't figure out texting. It's interesting because I uh, was talking to one of my kids the other day and I, you know, I will call them and they literally will not answer the phone. They literally will ignore the phone ring. But if you text them, they will answer. And this is what we were t I was alluding to earlier about a different language. They don't recognize the same type of cues. And of course, this is very generational. And when I first started to text a few years back, I remember my younger son saying, Dad, you can't do that. That's our stuff. I mean, he, he was serious. He was like, that's our thing. 
Uh, you check your email and it says no new messages, so you check it again and again. The average number of times that people check email right now is about 30 times a day. Now, we've done some research and there's been a lot of studies done on whether that's necessary and in fact it is not. And I'll talk a little bit about why people check email so obsessively over and over and over again. And once you know this, you'll, it'll make perfect sense to you why you check it. Because how many people check it over and over and you're like, I just checked it 10 minutes ago. Do I really need to check it? How many people have done that? It's very, very common and I'm going to tell you why you do that. Oh, you start tilting your head sideways to smile. I think that one's kind of funny. I don't think I can do that. Cyber sex is a replaced real-time sex, and you start to measure orgasms in megabytes. You wake up at 3 in the morning and go to the bathroom and stop to check your email on the way back to bed. Although now, of course, this joke was written a little while ago. Now you're going to have your phone under your pillow or next to your bed charging. How many people sleep next to their phones? There you go. I won't tell anybody. I do too, by the way. I have my phone near my bed. You spend half the plane trip with your laptop, with your laptop on your lap and your child in the overhead compartment. <laughs> you probably have to pay extra to, to do that now. As you heard before, I went to Turkey the other, uh, a couple of weeks ago to give a talk. And you have to pay for absolutely everything now when you travel on the plane. It was $100 just for my bag. It's just unbelievable. You stay in college for an extra year or two just to get the free internet access. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. When colleges first got wired, they were the, probably the first institution to really take advantage of wireless internet. And now, of course, virtually every campus in the country is completely wirelessly accessed by, uh, for internet at this point. But what they found, interestingly enough, after they did it, was that, uh, and this is true in the workplace as well, is that work performance or grade performance actually started to drop as internet access increased. So there is, a, there is an illusion with this technology that's very important to mention here. And the illusion is that the technology increases productivity, and it does not. None of this technology, whether it's in the school setting, uh, uh, at the uh, secondary or high school setting, or at the college level, or in the workplace, none of these technologies increase performance uh, productivity. In fact, if anything, they decrease it, and there are concomitant issues with it, and we'll talk a little bit about multitasking, uh, this afternoon because, in fact, there's no such thing as multitasking and there's been some good studies to prove that. But there's nothing like coming home and seeing your kid doing his homework. How many people have seen this? Laptop open, television on, phone next to them and their iPod next to them. And they're monitoring four or five channels of information and they swear to you that they are performing all of them equally well. And they are absolutely wrong. And we have data now to show that. Okay. Can you, be <laughs> can you be addicted to the internet? And can you see what he's got? He's got a, um, an IV of espresso. When I was in Hong Kong, I went into a, what are called cyber cafes. We don't really have these in the United States. Uh, they, they, I mean, they exist in some cities. But for the most part, most internet is accessed privately, either on your smartphone or on your laptop in your workplace or at home. But you don't really do it. In, I mean, occasionally you might go into Starbucks and, and go online. But for the most part, in our culture, it's done in the privacy of our own home. In Asia, that is not the case. They are done in cyber cafes. And there are literally thousands or tens of thousands of these in most Asian countries. And I mean thousands. So on, like, on every corner, there is a cyber cafe. And in the cafe, which is sort of like a CD, uh, I can't really describe it. There's just carol after carol of computer. And they're kind of not pleasant places, darkly, dimly lit. But one thing they have a lot of is caffeine. So people will sit there for hours and hours and hours, sometimes 10, 12, 15, 16, 18 hours. In some cases, they will forget to eat. They will not sleep. And in some smaller cases, they've died. 
they've literally left their bodily functions. And this is particularly in the area of gaming, video and computer gaming, or internet or MMTRG games, you know, multi-user games, which we'll talk about more this afternoon. So can you be addicted to the internet? The answer is absolutely yes. And this is nothing radical. When I first started talking about this in the 90s, when I would talk about it in the audience, a handful of people would raise their hand, and now I'm going to ask a question. How many people have seen some element related to the internet in their clinical work at this point? It's virtually 100%, maybe not 100, but 90% at this point. The internet is addictive, it is, and the um, American Academy of Addiction Medicine right now, did I say that right? I may not have. They have come out with official policies and official definitions of addiction, and they are now including internet and other digital media and behavioral technologies. They're sometimes called process addictions, and they are being included. The DSM-5, uh, DSM I'm sorry, task force is still working on a definition to include internet addiction or some form of behavior that encompasses internet or digital media. Digital media is probably a better term, but everybody uses the word internet, especially the media. So without equivocation, the internet is addictive. 